How do you do? Jen and Cam feel it would be unkind to present this program without a friendly word of warning. We are about to unfold our true crime podcast, a podcast of lifelong friends who seek to examine crimes which were committed without reckoning upon God. The discussion will be frank, and the subject matter will be of a grim and violent nature. I think it will thrill you. It might even horrify you. So, if there are young children listening, or if you feel unwilling to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Well, we've warned you. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. It's beautiful here, so I played outside all day yesterday. Well, played and did yard work, but I kind of like doing that when it's nice out because once it gets a little hot, I'm like a turtle. I hide in the house then the whole time. (laughs) Turtles like the heat, so. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. I I go back in my shell. What's new? Nothing. I watched my husband do yard work yesterday, so we kind of did the same thing. Okay. I managed it. Uh-huh. You, you managed it like mm-hmm. you from I was the, the manager. window mm-hmm. from the window did you like bang on the window and be a, you know i was over, encouraging him i was like good job with those rocks honey that's Aww. what i was doing that's look that's at you love go. Right there for you that is look love, at you go. let me tell you mm-hmm. i also told him where the drinks were when he came in when he was so hot oh, i'm like yeah okay. they're right over there in the refrigerator honey yeah i did that too yeah, yeah. Well, you want to dive right in? This is a little... Yeah, it's give a, it to it's me. It's not long. It's not short. It's about medium. But there is a lot to this story here, let me tell you. Okay. Do I need a piece of paper to follow along? You might. A little, uh, you know, like a little Venn diagram map so oh, you good. can connect the dots. And let me just say, before we get started, and I told you this, I cannot believe that this has not been made into a movie. This would be a blockbuster movie. I'm not kidding. And I did look up to see if a manuscript, because sometimes the People, you know, somebody will buy the rights to the story or whatever, and they'll create Mm -hmm. a manuscript, but it never gets bought. And as far as I can tell, that's not the case. So, you know, Jen, there's a saying, it's the quiet ones you have to look out for. And that saying could not apply more to this case. Let me tell you. So the beginning of the end started on May 29th, 1986. Los Angeles police were trying to bust a ring of thieves who were stealing yachts and then selling them. Now, the way that they would do this is they would go, and I'm sure this has happened all over. I've never heard of it. But then again, I don't run around with people that have yachts. They would go steal a yacht, then strip it, change the name, drop fake papers, and then sell the stolen yacht to some unsuspecting person. The detectives had received information that a yacht by the name of La Vita was stolen and was going to be docking nearby at Marina Bay Yacht Harbor in Richmond. Now that's just north of San Francisco for you Californians out there. Detectives were waiting for this yacht to pull in, and when it did, they wanted to have a little chat with the crew, in particular a man by the name of Robert Denzel Coons, who they believed was involved in this whole theft ring. As the yacht pulled in, a man jumped out to tie up the boat, And the man was not Robert Coons, but another man by the name of William Leisure, an LAPD officer. That's right, a police officer with the LAPD. So detectives were shocked to find that one of their very own was aboard a boat with this fella that they believed was stealing yachts. But Bill assured them that, you know, this was just a huge mistake. He doesn't know anything about any stolen yacht ring. He doesn't, you know, he's an LAPD officer, Jen. He's one of them. Right. Simple mistake. They take the men in for questioning. And William, we're going to call him Bill from here on out. Bill tells officers that Robert is his friend and they've been friends for a while now. Robert simply asked Bill to help him for the day. Now, why Coons was a man with a bit of a past, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Bill assured officers that they had it all wrong and Bill knew nothing about what they were talking about, the theft ring thing, right? Total wrong person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Robert Coons was a paroled bank robber who became friends with Bill through Robert's sister, who was a city prosecutor. How this ties in, and like I told you, there's a ton of people in this. Bill's wife is also a Los Angeles city prosecutor. 
and the four of them had become fast friends. Bill and Robert would often enjoy boating and diving, as well as take vacations together to do these activities. Bill had even been a reference for Robert with his parole officer. Looks pretty good when a police officer vouches for you. Coons made a pretty good amount of money working at various marinas by taking care of yachts, as well as working as a captain for the rich people who owned yachts, but didn't really know how to operate them. I love that fact. Bill would tag along often and help Robert occasionally when he had a day off or just wanted to get out for a bit. Bill Leisure was a cop that tended to fly under the radar. Bill had been a Marine stationed at Camp Pendleton and had a tour of duty in Vietnam. When Bill was honorably discharged in 1970, he decided to join the force. He was well-liked by his fellow officers and was described as a bit passive and shy, which is unlike most police officers on the force. Often officers give each other nicknames, and Bill, due to his timid manner, was dubbed Mild Bill. That's a terrible nickname. <laughs> <laughs> Mild well, it wouldn't Camille. be one that I'd like. I mean, it could be I get worse, it, though. It's a, it's a play on Wild Bill. It is. It is. But, yes, it is. Um, but the opposite. Officer Bill had never fired his gun while on duty, and his personnel file was full of letters from citizens he had helped while on the job. Perhaps he was a really nice or maybe just a little bit lazy, but he would often just talk to the person he pulled over and let them go with a warning, especially if it was a pretty young lady. Oh, okay, that's creepy, but... <laughs> Bill had been married since 1974 to Betsy, a prosecutor with the L.A. City Attorney's Office. Almost opposite of Bill, Betsy was a tough, smart lawyer who didn't mess around. Now, for the most part, Bill was usually quiet about his home life. However, a few of the policemen often wondered how a cop could afford all the nice things that Bill and Betsy have. Uh-oh. They had a really nice house, large swimming pool. They also had a rental home near Sun Valley, which is the skiing area. Mm -hmm. A condo in Long Beach, and that was right on the marina. Now, we all know police officers do not make that much money. City prosecutors, they probably do pretty well, but not it's not a defense attorney kind of salary. 18-year-old Terry Chen met Bill on the side of the road, literally. Her car had broken down, and she flagged Bill down. Bill was more than happy to help and got her car working right away. Terry was excited, but the fix was not free. Bill wanted to take Terry on a date, on his yacht. Terry was 18. She'd never had a boyfriend. She'd really never even been on a date. She was very young and nervous, but excited to go on a date with the nice police officer that helped her. A few days later, Terry met Bill at the marina, and Terry fell hard. Not on the dock, either. <laughs> wink, wink. Like us, yeah. She was in love immediately, and Bill felt the same way. Everybody was really happy that Terry and Bill were together. They were so happy for them. Except for Bill's wife. I would think so. Yeah, he's yeah. already married. Here comes the secrets, Jen. The couple would often hang out together with their good friends, Art and Ann Smith, on the weekends, enjoying a nice meal or an afternoon of boating. Art was a businessman who actually did quite well for himself. So much so that Ann, his wife, didn't need to work. She was also about 30 years younger than him. But once in a while, Anne would assist or help out with her mother, who owned a Highland Park beauty salon. And Anne was a classic beauty, like us, Jen. Mm -hmm. And Art was proud to have her on his arm. I think she was 37 and he was like 67, if I'm correct about that. Okay. Love has no age, especially when one of them have a lot of money. Am I well, right? and it's a legal <laughs> thing. She's of it age. Yeah, she is. In mm -hmm. 1979, Bill and Betsy are living their best life with Betsy none the wiser about Terry, his girlfriend. But Terry had a surprise for Bill. A surprise Terry was ecstatic about. And well, Bill didn't quite feel the same way. Mm. Terry told Bill that they were going to be having a little Bill Jr. in a few months. Ooh. Bill smiled and he faked a little bit of happiness. But when it sunk in, Bill dropped to one knee and asked Terry to marry him. Ah! Terry screamed with delight. She said, yes, 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 I love you. I guess Bill already forgot that he was already married, but, you know, <laughs> that happens sometimes. You he was just wrapped that. up in the moment. Just, That's just all. Just wrapped up in the he moment. He just got so excited. Didn't even think of his other family. That's right. 
Bill would often make excuses why he couldn't stay the night with Terry, such as he was called in on a case, or he had to get up early and work in the morning, or he wanted a good night's sleep consistently. (laughs) Would you buy that? No. I don't think so. Terry never caught on to the lies, but the cracks were beginning to form in the facade. Now, remember, she's 18, she, and she's yeah, that's why she never, in his 30s. Right? She, that's why she believed it. I mean, she was just young, and she hadn't lived life yet. As Terry's belly grew, so did Bill's apprehensions. One day, Bill went to Terry, and he demanded she have an abortion, or he was out of there. Terry's devastated, but with no money, she does what Bill wanted, and she has an abortion. Bill is getting his way, and life is going just the way he wants it, for a bit, that is. He arrives home on May 2nd, 1980, to find his wife, Betsy, crying. She can barely get out the words. Their good friend, Ann Smith, Art Smith's wife, had been murdered that morning. Bill can't believe it, and he rushes out the door and back to the station to find out just what was going on. Now, back at the station, Bill was placed in an interrogation room where he denied having anything to do with any of the boat-stealing nonsense, stating that he and his wife made plenty of money and they didn't need to steal. But there was just one tiny, little bitty issue. The big boat in their yard? (laughs) Or the eight cars, but we'll get to that. Yeah. Bill had told police that Coons and another crew member by the name of Gino picked Bill up in Long Beach. Now, Gino was not so Kino on the story, and he insisted that all three of them boarded the yacht together in San Diego. Now, this changes things because La Vida had been reported stolen from a marina in San Diego. Bill was saying he, you know, he got picked up in Long Beach, but he didn't. He got picked up in San Diego and stole the boat. See where this is going? We're rounding Uh it up. So Gino is kind of like, that is not true. We got him in San Diego. All three of us. We didn't pull over in Long Beach and get him. This is just what the police need to hold Bill and I guess for as long as they can and do a little dive into Bill and all of his shenanigans. I mean, business dealings. Now, Bill had never been looked at by internal affairs, but that's about to change with the birth of the LAPD task force to take a good long look into Officer Bill Leisure. You with me so far? Mm hmm. As the LAPD task force, takes a look into Bill. Police learn that Bill's yacht was purchased from none other than Robert Coons. That's right. See, you said he had a boat. He does have a boat, Jen, as a police officer. All the cool kids do, you know. Of course. And that boat had been reported as being stolen. Things aren't looking so good, and ship's about to hit the fan. (laughs) Uh (laughs) I saw what you did there. Nice little pun, hon. Thanks. The task force head over to the home of Bill and Betsy, and they talk about a treasure of goodies. Now, there were the planes and the cars that were picked apart, looking as if they had exploded all over the backyard. Inside the large garage was a hoarder's paradise. I thought about you, Jen. Oh, and I wrote this. Or a place you would love to shop. See? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are the best places. The hoarders are mm -hmm. the best for uh, estate sales. There were various items from fishing gear to artwork, and it had all been reported stolen from various stolen yachts. He even had the name board, you know, the one that goes on the back of the boat, of uh-huh. a stolen yacht hanging up proudly on the wall in his garage. Oh, his garage, well, by him. the way, was about an eight car garage, eight car holding garage. He liked so it was small. Small, very small for a police mm. officer. Mm. Officers also locate a car that had been reported stolen by its owner and even had the keys still in the ignition. Now, this is in the back of his house. Are you kidding me? (laughs) It's a little odd there, Bill. It had been reported stolen by Ralph Gerard's wife. Make that, you ready? Officer Ralph Gerard, the partner of Bill Leisure. Did you see what happened there? Did Mm -hmm. you get that? I did. I did. A little shady? I would think so. A little shady? Yeah. Did I also mention that Ralph was the co-owner of the stolen yacht with Bill being the other owner? Mm, There's that, too. So with this, Ralph Gerard was charged with receiving stolen property and filing false insurance claims. He would later be acquitted of the stolen property charges, but the insurance fraud charges stuck, and he was sentenced to five years probation and received a permanent vacation from the LAPD. As in, bye bye, he was fired. Mm-hmm. 
well, as he should be. Mm -mm -mm. Officers did not yet know that they had found what would become the single most important piece of evidence in the case and one that would cause the case to take a turn no one saw coming or even suspected. A notebook with the name Dennis France. The notebook had explicit details of the boat business, and they hoped Dennis would be able to fill in the pieces on how it all worked. Investigators need to find Dennis France and see if he is involved in this yacht theft ring. And boy, does Dennis France have a story to tell. When they find him, officers set up a meeting with Dennis in August of 1986 at a restaurant that Bill and Dennis would often have dinner. The idea was that police would imply that his name in the notebook alone would be enough to get him to spill the beans on the theft ring. Now, Dennis was no dummy, and he wanted to make sure if he squealed, he would receive immunity. Now, Dennis, you see, knew a lot about Bill Leisure, more than any other officers knew. He was scared of Bill and scared of what he would do to not only himself, but his family. He needed more than immunity. He needed protection. At this point, investigators are wondering why Dennis is being so cagey about the business, but Dennis will not provide anything without the assurance of immunity. Dennis asks them if, say, you know, he killed people, would he still get immunity? Because Dennis is like, I, I need this immunity. And he says, of course, he did not, but he just wanted to know, you know, if curious if that would still be the case if he got immunity. The police officers are kind of like, you're just being weird. So they go and they place a phone call to their boss seeking permission to give this guy immunity to squeal on Bill Leisure mm -hmm. about the theft ring. So they speak with Sergeant David Wiltrot, who told them to give Dennis whatever he wants. An interesting side note here is that Sergeant would take an early retirement due to the stress of this case. And I know you and I is have talked about retirement in quotations. He quit early. Let's put it that way. Okay. You and I have talked about this on the show, because if you commit a crime, you have to do it yourself. And if you're going to do it with people, well, how many uh -huh. times do we say this? Somebody's going to squeal. But the thing is, you have to be the first one in the door to rat yep. on your other people to get the best deal. Otherwise, so keep, you're SOL. Yeah, that is correct. So keep that in mind with dear Dennis here. So investigators load Dennis France in a car and they take him to the office of the assistant district attorney assigned to the special investigations division. This department is the one that's responsible for investigating and charging dirty police officers. Once more, France wanted to make sure he would not be held liable for what he was about to say. Once it was confirmed on paper and signed off on, police would come to realize they made the worst mistake that they could have in the case. Why is that? He's going to walk away and you're going to see why he's going to like what he did and why he shouldn't be walking away. Dennis Franz leaned back in his chair as the officers prepared to take notes on the details of the theft ring. Dennis lets out a sigh, and then he spoke. I killed two people for Bill Leisure, and I drove the car on a third hit. Oh, oh shit. That's and he, a little bit. He yeah. was just promised immunity, and he killed three people. What? Oh, he's no dummy. Well, he killed two, but he was, who's to say who did the third? Oh, yeah, we're going to find out here in a minute. Police officers and investigators, I'm sure they were like, what? Screech, tire screech. No, this is not at all what they were expecting to hear. And that's why they gave them immunity. They had planned to hear all about the theft ring, the money, how right. it worked, where they got their yachts. And instead, the case went from a theft ring to a murder case. Right. All while giving the murderer a pass. Get out of jail free card. He ain't no dummy, though. I mean, if you're going to work mm -mm. the system, he did it really damn well. He really did. Shoo. With the case taking a turn, a murder investigation was launched. Two new detectives were placed in the role of taking on the murder investigation portion of the case. When the detectives take a look at Dennis Franz, they are not so convinced he was telling the truth. He had trouble with dates and names and general details. Now, Dennis was a welder from Downey who could barely read or write. He was semi-literate, I guess you'd say. He was far from the brilliant murder-for-hire spy that we see in the movies. So police are kind of like questioning maybe he's just, maybe he has a, a beef with Bill Leisure, or maybe he's wanting a little instant fame. Who knows? So as they continue chatting with Dennis France, France tells the detectives he could take them to the sites of the murders. 
It was here that the welder convinced detectives that he was, in fact, a killer. He provided details that only a killer would know, such as a photo of his family standing by the family car, the same car that was a match for the car that was spotted leaving one of the murder scenes. So it was those little details. So he he didn't have names and dates, but there were things like that, which, uh-huh. you know, they believed him. Let's put it that way. Investigators gather the information and they put it all together. On May 20th, 1977, 76-year-old Gilberto Cervantes, 76 years old, was shot and killed right in his front yard as he returned home from church. Now, the gentleman was the owner of a very extensive, big, well-known El Sol tortilla factory in Los Angeles, and he had many business dealings in and around the L.A. area. He was worth quite a bit of money. At the scene, nothing had been taken, so robbery was out, and police believed that it was an intentional hit. It had not been solved yet. Dennis France tells them that he was the getaway driver in this case and that the killer was a man by the name of Dennis Weinbau. Dennis Franz was the neighbor of Dennis Weinbau, and Bill Leisure had paid Weinbau for the hit. The person that ordered the hit? Drumroll, please. Cervantes, stepson and daughter-in-law, Antonio or Tony, and Paulette de la Reyes, all because they wanted to control the tortilla factory. And Cervantes had threatened to cut them off because of their lavish spending. I I still don't understand why people, I just, you're going to order a hit on your parents that raised you is not bad enough, right? But then you go and you hire, come on, come on. Do they not watch these true crime shows? Well, obviously they don't care. I guess they do not. But again, we always talk about if, let's say, if your husband could kill his parent, why do you think he won't kill you? They have that ability to do it. What's going to stop them to sleep in with one eye open? You know what I'm saying? Well, they're always like, well, he's only doing it for the money. Well, check your life insurance policies. Turns out right after the murder, Paulette and the stepson, Tony de la Reyes, were considered the prime suspects. And there was even an anonymous letter sent to the police stating that a man by the name of Dennis Weinbaugh was the one who pulled the trigger. Police were never able to locate a man by this name to question him, so the case went cold. Bill Leisure would later say he was not involved in this murder. However, everyone pointed to him as being the one that orchestrated the details. So yes, he did not actually pull the trigger. He was not in the car, but he's the one that set it up and made it happen. Uh-huh. Mild Bill. Mm-hmm. Not as nice as he seems. As not. So, as I just said with you, and we talked about, you know, if your spouse is going to kill somebody, how maybe you do sleep with your eye open. And, and maybe little Tony should have done that because guess what? It was around 2 a.m. when Tony de la Reyes was gunned down as he left a Sherman Oaks bar in 1981. Now, this is the same Tony that had inherited his father's estate worth over 600000 which equals $1.7 million in today's world. It was Dennis France who pulled the trigger on this one while Bill Leisure drove. They were hired by none other than Tony's wife, Paulette. That's why I said, like, Paulette. Oh, it, so she was the one. The two of them killed his dad, and mm-hmm. then she killed him because she wanted all of it. Yeah. She didn't want to share. Now, the third murder victim's name may sound a bit familiar, but police were struggling on this one because it had already been solved. Or so they thought. So Dennis is going to present them with all this information, and they think this case has been solved. So keep that in mind as we go. On May 2nd, 1980, during the early morning hours, a masked man entered a Highland Park beauty salon right after it opened. The man marched past all the other employees and customers, as well as the cash register, to go straight to a woman in the back of the store. He grabbed the woman and took her to the back, where he shot her in the chest and then escaped out the back door. The woman was Ann Smith, who was married to Art Smith, and this all went down as Ann's mother stood there in shock. Art and Ann had been going through a divorce at the time she was killed, and police initially entertained the idea that maybe Art had put a hit out on his wife. However, just nine months later, a petty criminal addicted to drugs named Charles Persico was arrested. They believed at the time it was just a robbery gone bad. Police offered Charles a plea deal, and he would get out in about six years. 
He took it knowing it would be much better than possibly going away for life. So Charles Persico took a plea deal, said he killed Ann Smith, and he's in jail. Dennis France, however, is saying that is not the case. So police and investigators are thoroughly confused, I guess. I kind of am, too, obviously. So they want to know if Persico actually did do this murder or if he was innocent. Is Dennis lying? So with all this information from Dennis France that he was the actual killer of Ann Smith, officers go to see where Bill was the day that Ann was killed. Now, it seems Bill had called in sick the day of Ann's murder. Hmm. Investigators knew that Persico had sat in prison for three years, so they worked to get him out. It would take a bit of time, but Persico would be exonerated. The backstory being here, he was on drugs. He couldn't really remember if he did it or not, but he knew that if he went to court and went to trial, he could, you know, he could face life in prison. He took the plea deal, okay? He was innocent. He did not do it, by the way. Detectives knew Bill Leisure was responsible for more than stealing a few boats, but they needed to get him on all of this, and they needed a plan. Enter Dennis France again. Police want him to work for them. They want him wired up, and they want to send him in to get Bill Leisure to talk, hopefully to confess. Now, first up is Dennis Weinbaugh. Dennis France called him and tried to get him to confess or at least describe some details, and he did not disappoint. They needed him to bring Bill into this mess. So Dennis France said that Bill Leisure paid for the hit on Cervantes, but Weinbaugh counterdicted it. This is confusing. I'm telling you guys, stay with it, but just this is what happens when you put a whole mess of people in there. Obviously, this is not what police wanted. Dennis Weinbaugh said something to the fact of Bill knows everything and knows nothing at all, basically meaning he would play dumb and it would be every person for himself. Please go to the next one, Art Smith. Dennis Franz calls Art and said he wanted to talk to him about the beauty shop. Now, maybe it's just me, but if I got a phone call like that, and knowing that maybe I was involved, let's pretend I'm involved, I'd be a little suspicious and play Mm -hmm. dumb, right? I'd play so dumb, and I'm good at that. (laughs) Well, half the time that's not playing, but okay. That's what I'm Mm -hmm. saying. At first, Art did play dumb, but then he basically told Dennis to shut up since they're on the phone and that they should enrage an in-person meeting. Big shocker here. Art failed to show up for the meeting. Art may not have said it out loud, but what he didn't say told detectives all they needed to know. When you're on the phone from this guy saying, you know, let's talk about this murder of your wife, he should have kept playing dumb. Not, shut up, let's meet somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's totally not on the phone. And finally, it is Paulette's turn. And at first, she denies it. Now, she's the one that was in on having Cervantes killed and then Tony killed her husband. At first, she denies it all. But then she finally admits to what she thought was a friend that she asked Bill to kill her husband. She did add that she did not pay Bill. But Bill told her that he may come to her later on for a favor one day. (laughs) And she would need to pay up. So with lots to work with, they have one more person that they want to try to get on the wiretap, Bill's wife, Betsy. She did not give them any proof that she was involved in any of Bill's illegal activities. The only thing they found was that she lied about her Mercedes Benz and claimed that she got it from her dying dad. Well, it turns out that her dying dad was actually friend Art Smith. The district attorney, the DA charged her with perjury on that, but Bill Leisure claimed that she had just simply filled out a form incorrectly. (laughs) Charges were thrown out, but she was let go from her job. Hmm. Time for the big one now, Jen. And this is good. Bill Leisure is still sitting in jail, still waiting. You know, as far as he knows, he's still sitting there with the theft Mm -hmm. thing. He doesn't realize that investigators have uncovered so much more. Investigators need to get Dennis France to go into jail and chat it up with Bill. But they want to make sure they don't make any mistakes. They decide to not only wiretap Dennis, but they set up cameras all around the room, hidden cameras. They know Bill knows how this works and they can't fail. They already know that Bill would not say anything out loud because very well could be taped. What Bill didn't count on was the videotaping. And we're going to get to that right now. Dennis France goes to the visiting center at the L.A. County Jail. At first, Bill and Dennis small talk. But then police notice that Bill is writing a note, but he's talking 
to Dennis at the same time. Thank goodness they have all the cam- cameras in there, so they zoom in on the notes as he's holding them up to the glass. The first one reads, don't say anything, as he's talking. So audibly, you could hear him talking, but he's writing these notes to show his right. friend, well, who he thinks is his friend, Dennis. So they're still talking as if, you know, it's just a friendly jail visit amongst two criminals. But he continues writing notes. Dennis knows that he has to talk in code so that Bill understands what he's asking but also so that it is clear to investigators who are taping. Dennis asked Bill, in that Avenue 60 thing, what happened to that one? Bill responds, melted. And this isn't verbal. Again, this is on paper. And bam, <clears throat> they have him. Avenue 30 in Figueroa is where the beauty salon was located and where Ann Smith was murdered. So that was the reference to the Avenue 60 thing that Dennis made. That one was referring to the gun used to kill Ann, and Bill's response meant that he had the barrel of the gun melted down to eliminate a criminalist being able to identify a particular weapon as having been possibly identified as the weapon used in the crime. Bill then writes a note asking, any brass? This is Bill asking Dennis if, when the police searched his home, did they find any bullets? Dennis is a bit confused at this point since the gun had been melted, so it didn't matter. It doesn't matter if they found it or not. Then Bill writes, they have the one. This is the bullet that was used to kill Ann Smith. Bill just keeps digging himself in a deeper hole. He's giving them more than they even thought. You would think he would know better. He's writing notes. He doesn't realize there's a camera there. No, but you would. Verbally, he's saying one thing. You would think. Mm hmm. Because he's a right. police officer. You would think he that he know would know how, that how this works. Yeah. Not to do anything mm-hmm. to incriminate himself. Mm-hmm. To play dumb. That hole's getting deeper. However, it finally happened. Bill saw a flashing red light from a hidden camera behind Dennis as he was leaning forward with this final note for Dennis. The note said, dump everything illegal. Officers had all they needed to go after Bill Leisure, and he knew it. He wasn't even mad. He just kind of like hung his head and went like, because he was dumb. (laughs) He should have. Boy, did I do it. He should have known better. Yeah. So for him, the gig was up, it Jen. Was up. The heat was on. The pig was roasted. Smokey got his bandit. The boy in blue is now the boy in blaze orange. Your stripes, depending on How where you're you from. How long did you work on all of those? I was giggling. <laughs> <I'm stupid. laughs> I know. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, it's funny. So murder charges were filed in May 1987 against William Leisure. The charges were only in the murders of Ann Smith and Antonio de la reyes because there was insufficient evidence to charge him with cervantes death now many who knew mild bill they could not believe that he would be involved in any of this and some and i think one of them was his boss even went on to say this this is a gimmick there's something not right like he's doing an undercover job for somebody else and we don't know about it maybe the fbi really they just could not believe that they this little mild meek guy did all this he was the one that never even liked to write speeding tickets. The story of William Leisure was splashed all over the papers nationwide, and this is just how his adoring mistress, Terry, found out about Bill. And by find out, I mean everything. Not only his thieving ways, but the murder hits. Oh, and he's uh-huh. married. This is how she found out. Can you believe it? I can. Yeah. I mean, he's not going to tell her. So we all... That's right. We all know, Jen, hell hath no fury Mm -hmm. like a woman scorned. She jumps on the phone and she calls the FBI and she's like, "Ooh, she's on fire. She gives them anything and everything they want, including all the bank records, which show more than just a few transactions between Coons and Bill Leisure. He made her get rid of the pregnancy. So, of course, she's going to be angry. She still thought they were getting in, they were going to get married and then were in love. I know. Love, Jen. Good for her. 
Bill's wife finds out about the mistress, and while she's not happy about it, she believes there is no way that Bill could have ever killed anybody. Maybe stolen a few yachts. Maybe stolen a few cars. few hearts. Maybe stolen a few hearts, but not killed anybody. Mm-hmm. Finally, on April 15th, 1991, the trial begins. Now, at this point, you would think it would be a media circus with a cop-turned-killer. However... During this time in Los Angeles, something else was going on and was commanding all the attention. Now think about the date here for you. There was actually two high-profile cases. The first one, and this was terrible because this is a rabbit hole I went down and had to learn all about this. The first one was a case that they had dubbed the Dalton Street Police Vandalism Case. Hmm, okay, because I don't remember ever hearing that. But apparently during an August night in 1988, ironically, 88 police officers raided two apartment buildings located at 39th and Dalton in Los Angeles. Now, they're looking for drugs. Okay. Okay. That's, that's okay. what they do. Now, the, that's what they do. 88 of them, though. The officers not only busted down doors, Jen, and broke windows, but they slashed furniture. They poured bleach all over the place and clothes and carpet and furniture. They ripped cabinets off the wall. They punched holes in the walls. They even destroyed family photos. They even emptied out the refrigerator. What? But the worst that they did, and this is why, you can't buy intelligence, I'll tell you that, and you can't work for it either. They left little messages behind on the walls, as in graffiti, saying things like LAPD rules, (laughs) among some other notes, right? Mm -hmm. The second thing that was going on, now this one we knew about. Were they kids? I mean, were these, like... No, they were police officers. And they would like put like their badge number. I mean, just how old are you? They were getting sick of the gangs uh, hitting that. Well, I get it. LA in the late 80s. I mean, why would you tear up family photos and empty out the refrigerator? We're tired of the gangs. So we're going to write cops rule and put our badge number on things. That what does that family photos? It doesn't do anything. It tells on themselves. That's what it does. If you leave your badge number up there, obviously not good, boys and girls. Not good. The second thing that was going on, and this one we do know about, uh, had occurred only a month prior to the start of the trial, and that is the infamous Rodney King beating, and that took place on March 13th, so it was almost exactly a month before. Both of these cases took all the attention away from Killer Bill, which I'm just, I can't believe that you know me, you know that I'm, I cannot believe I've never heard of William Leisure. I really can't, just because, I don't know. I would think that this would have been a bigger case. case. Bill's attorneys were Richard Lasting, who, of course, I had to look all this up, who is still alive, I do believe, and practicing in Santa Monica, and Michael White, who I believe has since passed away from leukemia. Yeah, because I go look them up and I want to find out if they're still out there. The team was quick to point out that the prosecution's only witnesses were all friends of Bill and were in on the scheme. So that kind of makes them not exactly trustworthy, Uh which I got to kind of agree. With Dennis Franz being the only one to come out and say that Bill did these murders, they would need to rely on others to either agree or disagree with Dennis Franz. People like Dennis Weinbaugh. Oh, wait. Seems like right before he was set to testify, Dennis died of a heart failure. For real? Or are we going to find out? For real. Oh, okay. No, he really did. I was going to say it. Did somebody make it look like it? He was the one that could have really put this all together. That's why I wondered if it really was heart failure, if it wasn't, you know. No. Well, I mean, according to this, it was. Air quotations. Heart Mm -hmm. failure. Yeah, who knows? Failure. The next blow to the case was Art Smith. Art Smith previously had decided that he would testify against Bill Leisure, trying to kind of save himself, of course. Well, he steps up when it's his turn, and he decides he's not going to testify. He said with his appeal pending, he didn't want Chance messing it up. See, this guy's still hoping he's not going to be involved in any of this and get out of, you know, planning his wife's murder or hiring somebody to kill her. When Dennis France took the stand, he provided a blow-by-blow account of exactly how it all went down. Claimed Art Smith wanted his wife dead rather than give her one red cent of his money in the divorce. Dennis France explained exactly how he entered the beauty shop and provided clear and damning details about it all. The videotape of Bill Leisure 
using notes to communicate with Dennis Franz while in jail was the best that the prosecution had at this point. Defense attorneys argued that the messages were not about murders at all, Jen, but about guns. Mm. Bill had purchased and feared that these guns that he had purchased were actually out on the street and being used in crimes. Mm. So he just chose to talk and code. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What a sweet man. The prosecution argued that if Bill Leisure was an innocent man with no knowledge of the murders, Bill would have never said those things. But instead, quote, those are the words of a guilty man. They are the words of a man who drove the getaway car into murders, end quote. Which I kind of kind of agree I was going to say, I don't think he's wrong. The jury deliberated four weeks. I thought that was an excessive amount of time. Is it not? I feel it is, but... <laughs> they needed a unanimous decision, um, and they there's could always not a agree holdout. on all the charges. One juror claimed that why he thought Bill Leisure did it, the case was not proved beyond the shadow of a doubt. He refused to convict. So after four weeks of deliberating, deadlock. They were done, right? Mistrial, you're out. We're going to do it again. Hung jury. Right before his second trial would begin, Bill takes a plea deal that would change the first-degree murder charge to second-degree murder and make all of the yacht theft charges disappear. And if they would do that, Bill Leisure would agree to plead no contest. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) He just wants a lesser degree. Whatever. Bill Leisure would claim that he was taken advantage of by Coons and said, quote, one of my character flaws is I tend to see the good in people instead of the bad. (sighs) And look where it's got me, end quote. Bill. Oh, Bill. Aw. He's so mild. William Ernest Leisure is now 74 years old, and he is still serving time at the Mule Creek State Prison in Ione, California. Now, part of being able to be paroled, as we probably may or may not know, is that you have to stand before the parole board. You have to admit your crime, show your remorse, before you can even be considered for Mm -hmm. parole. Bill Leisure still has not done this, and he remains in prison today when he could have been eligible for parole after serving 15 years. He won't do it. Stubborn. He will not do it. He won't admit that he had any part in that. I would to get parole. I would, even if I wasn't. I would, too. To get out of prison? Yeah. So here's what happened to the rest of these little characters that we talked about. Dennis Weinbaugh was charged with and eventually convicted for his part in the murder plot and was sentenced to life in prison. However, like I said, he had a heart attack and died before he could actually serve that time. Here comes the deals, Jen. Mm -hmm. Like they say, there's no honor among thieves, and so it's every person for themselves. Art Smith was charged with hiring someone to murder his wife and was sentenced to life in prison. He agreed to testify against Bill, like I said earlier, but changed his mind because he wanted to have a better deal for mm-hmm. himself. He should have just testified because he ended up getting life. Paulette de la Reyes agreed to testify as long as her charges were reduced to second degree murder and solicitation to commit murder. After she testified, this is so weird, the second degree murder charge was dismissed. And she was sentenced to time served, which was, in the end, about two years. And she was freed. What? Robert Coons also cut a deal. He agreed to plead guilty in exchange for the 10-year sentence to be lowered to two years, as well as agreeing to testify that Bill Leisure told him on several occasions that he was, in fact, involved in the murders of Ann Smith and Antonio de la Reyes. Dennis Franz walked away a free man and was not prosecuted in any of these crimes. And just like putting salt on a bitter wound, Jen, the police even had to give him all his guns back. He wasn't charged with anything. Mm -hmm. Betsy, Bill's wife, was tried on several counts, including lying to police and obstruction of justice. But good old Betsy was acquitted. While they could never prove it, and I think it would be wise to say she had to know something was going on. I would think so. Don't you? Oh, I do. Little Betsy. And you'll notice I didn't say her last name because Betsy still practices law in California. And she even, uh, I think it was 2009 or 2012, represented a murder suspect. I looked her up. Charles Persico, uh, the man that said the crack addict who took the plea deal and was serving time for the murder of Ann Smith, even though he didn't do it, was exonerated in the summer of 1992. 
Following the convictions of Bill Leisure and Art Smith, Persico was paid $150,000 by the city of Los Angeles in a settlement of a lawsuit against the LAPD for its handling of the case. Okay. Still three years of your life down the drain, but okay. On September 14th, 1992, he was awarded $4.8 million in a federal civil rights case for his wrongful conviction. This amount would equal $2,000 for each of the 1,659 days he spent in prison. However, no records have ever been located indicating that he ever received the money awarded to him. Thank you to the National Registry of Exonerations.com. So he never got any money whatsoever, huh? I think he got the 150. He didn't get the 4.8. That is the story of William Leisure. Now, is this a movie deal? Is this a movie? It is a movie. Can't you see it? I can see it totally. Paulette is like, you know, rich wife of the the bad boy that married the bad boy stepson that that is the heir to the tortilla factory, you know, uh, dynasty, whatever. And I mean, this just has so many good characters in it. Dennis France, the barely literate welder who's like smart enough to make them sign papers so he is not responsible for the people he killed. Yeah, he's no dummy. Say what? Wow. Yeah, I did look up Charles Persico to see if I could find him. I could not find him. So Every time you know. say Persico, I think of Serpico. Serpico, so did mm-hmm. I. Mm-hmm. Yep, me too. Yep, me too, Jen. So that is the case. Wow, that's wild. Mm-hmm. There was a lot to it, and so I hope I did it justice because there's a lot of people, you know, and um, this Bill, mild Bill. Mm-hmm. Unmild Bill. Meeky, yeah, he was just, he looked like your 1970s middle age or approaching middle age police officer. When you think of that, little thinning hair. Little porn stash. Those little, yeah, mm-hmm. yes, exactly, exactly. And the little cop sunglasses, but then also the regular cop glasses. The what Dahmer glasses? Yeah, yeah, yes. Jeffrey yes. Dahmer? Yeah. Yeah, those are yes. coming back. My yes. daughter wanted to get some of those, and I'm like, you know, they're not. Oh, I think they're cute. I think they're cute on kids. I really do. Yeah, but I, but I didn't want to look at Jeffrey Dahmer every time I looked at her. So, <laughs> well, now that you gave it a name like that, now that's what I would yeah. think of too. I mean, because that's what they look like to mm-hmm. me. That's the kind that Dahmer had. There is a, a really good book on mm-hmm. this, and it is called. And I did not read the book. I regret to tell you, but I did pull a few quotes from it, and it is "Murderer with the Badge" by Edward Humes. H U M E S. And um, yeah, he just. I'm telling you, it's, I don't know, it's just, and you know, he was smart that he flew, he did fly under the radar on purpose mm-hmm. because he couldn't be Interesting. flashy. Interesting. Well, um, let's make it into a movie. Let's turn it. Who I'm, would you I'm cast? I'm serious. I cannot believe. Who oh, would you gosh. cast? He's not unattractive, but he, like I said, he looks like that late 30s. Well, it's Hollywood, 40s. so it's going to be, a, it doesn't matter um, who it is. It's going to be attractive, right? Leo. It's Hollywood. I, I told you I'd go with Leo. Leo DiCaprio. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the wife could be. Betsy, she's the smart, no nonsense prosecutor. I'm gonna go Scarlett Johansson, okay. mm, or Blake Lively. But, but no, I'm gonna go Scarlett because you need somebody with a little bit of a harder edge because she was a little bit stronger. And mm-hmm. then Terry, his cute little mistress that has to be a little ingenue. Uh, Selena Gomez, maybe you know, Dennis Franz. Oh God, I, th- so Dennis Franz. So many good characters could play that guy, right? Because he's kind of like you'd have to be a little bit. Because I picture him as being a little portly. A little smarmy, you know, because he's mm-hmm. he's the welder, but he'll also, for a price, he'll take out your wife. Somebody like that. I'll have to think on it, I guess. But yeah, I, I honestly, I can't believe this isn't a movie because there's so many good characters in it, too. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. That's it. Very that's interesting. This week's promo is a new podcast that's coming out, but it's got some of our favorite podcasters. As doing the podcast, ready? Who is it? The name of the podcast is called The Path Went Chilly. Oh, I like that. And what it is, is Robin Warner from A Trail Went Cold. Get Mm -hmm. it? Path Mm -hmm. Went Mm -hmm. Chilly. Mm -hmm. Uh I do. Then we have Dr. Jules from Riddle Me That. And her buddy, Dr. Ashley. They are all getting together and they are discussing Robin's favorite cases. Oh. That's that good. have still not been solved. So oh, the path went chilly. Yeah. So it should When's, be fun. Looking I forward to it. I will be checking it. it out. That That's pretty good. I can't wait. All right, Jen. Remember, till uh, we speak the next time, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye-bye. Love ya. Today, 
Today's episode was researched and written by me, Cam. For more information about this episode, as well as all the sources I used, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at ourtruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by hosts Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. Our True Crime Podcast is executive produced by Nico Vertese and Dick Bain. Make sure to like and subscribe to Our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. You can email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. If you really like the show, make sure to check out our Patreon at Our True Crime Podcast. Our True Crime Podcast is an OTC production. Hi, I'm Robin Warder from The Trail Went Cold. If you are unfamiliar with my other podcast, I often cover stories from the television show Unsolved Mysteries. For the past five years, you've heard me talk about these cases on my own, but now's your chance to hear me have in-depth discussions about them with other people. I want to welcome you to my new project, The Path Went Chilly, where I will be discussing in-depth with my two good friends and co-hosts cases that I've covered on The Trail Went Cold. Meet my co-hosts. First one up is Jules. Hi, I'm Jules from the podcast Riddle Me That True Crime, and I have a PhD in transpersonal counseling. I'm not a psychologist or a diagnostician, so don't get too excited. But I can't wait to analyze these cases with these two amazing humans. You've already met Robin. Now meet Dr. Ashley Wellman. Hi, I'm Ashley. I have a PhD in criminology, law, and society, and I specialize in trauma victims and survivors. I've spent a great deal of time working with families left behind after homicides with a cold case unit based out of Florida. And I'm also a professor of criminology. I'm so excited to be chatting with two of my best friends about the cases that everyone can't seem to get enough of. We hope in doing so that we will have a clearer perspective of what may have transpired. Oftentimes, Ashley will be totally in the dark. Jules and I will be telling Ashley a story she may not know much about, so all of her reactions are genuine. We will be releasing on all major platforms April 8th. We hope you will join us as we attempt to heat up some ice cold cases. The Pathwind Chili will be available every Thursday on all major podcast platforms. Nico, I almost died from a serial killer last night. In your dreams? No, Hayden left his window open all night long. So when I got up this morning, I was like, oh. It's cold in here. What is that? And I went over like by his door and his door was shut and you could just, you could hear the wind howling through his room and his his window's wide open and you know, it's like two feet off the ground. If that somebody could have just came in here and got me. No, they would have gotten him first and that might've been a relief. They're not here. That's the thing. (laughs) Nobody's here. It was just me. Oh, that's why it's frightening. It is. You know. If he would have been here, then I, I, whatever. You know the point. All right. Uh, let's do a moment of silence for our friend Nico. And then we will get going. <laughs> that we? sounds bad, but yeah. Okay. What not that what you call a moment of, moment of zen? Moment of zen. Let's go that way. Okay. okay. I said right. I'm sorry. I said right. I no, said, I said I, right. Too. I know, but I'm saying right too. Because you are right. City prosecutors, they probably do pretty well, but not. It's not a defense attorney kind of salary, right? Sorry, so right would again. you say that their uh, motto would be a la vita? A what? Oh, la vita. <laughs> si, si, a la senor. vita, which means this is life, I think, right? Or oh, is this life or this is the life? Something no. like that. That's cute, though. No. Live in la vida loca. So that's crazy life. So then it would just be the life. But still, they are living the life. So I see right. where you're going with that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we just have to talk in circles is to the life. each other. There is you go. the life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We got six pages to go. I'm telling there's going to be a lot of the cast of characters <laughs> coming up here. Hold on. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. It's not the Corona. It's not Corona. It's just. I was gonna make a joke it's the it. amount of incense that's down here in the basement. <laughs> I can't believe mm. it. I should know that, though. The kids are reverting back to the hippie days. I get it. Dennis Franz, like the actor Dennis Franz? France, like the country. Oh, France. Okay. France. But, yeah, could be like that. I thought you Dennis meant like the Franz. Hill Street Blues. That's Dennis Franz. Oh, the Z. Well. 
That's okay. Tomato, Isn't that ironic? Because I think the last episode we talked about Mark Paul Gosler, and I mentioned that he had worked with Dennis Franz on NYPD oh. Blue. And here we are, a couple weeks. Fast forward, here we are, talking well, about that them again. Seven degrees of uh, Dennis Franz. That guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Franz, oh Franz, whatever you want to. <laughs> tomato, tomatoes. Tomato. With the case taking a turn, a murder investigation was launched. Detectives Addison, Bud, R. <laughs> I know, right? Um, Bud. Bud. Just like, they just that up. It's funny how you said it. Where does that even come from? That. Like, that's not part of his name. His name's Addison. But okay, whatever. Detective mm, name. Detectives Addison, Bud, R. God dang it. R. R it's R. A R C E. How would you say that? Arse. Arse? No, it is arse. But it has a C. How do you say that? Oh, Arc? A R C S? E. Ours. It looks like ours. A R C. Are you sure you wrote it correctly? <laughs> Probably. Mm. <laughs> Hold on. Let's see here. I'm gonna I'm gonna take their names out of it. I'm just gonna save the detectives. Oh boy. Sorry. Okay. Or not Goodfellows. Uh, oh, never mind. I can't even think. The Godfather. Yeah. Thanks. I'm gonna make you an offer you can't refuse. <clears throat> Constituting both compens comp compensor. Good, good word. Compensort. Nope. Compensation. Com. Nope. Compen. Oh my god, I can say it, but I can't look at it. Com. Compens. Com <clears throat> We're gonna change it to compensation. Compensation. Compensatory. Nope. Comp Compensat. Cons compensatory. Yes, I can't say it. What is wrong with me? Compensatory. Is that right? Compensatory. Constituting both compens. Compensor. Oh my god. <laughs> <sighs> uh. A punitive damages as long as compensatory. Nope. Compen compensatory. Compen compensatory. There we go. Compensatory. I got it. God. Words are hard. On September 4th. <coughs> I, I can't even. Con 